Today, we are going to look at, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And Pastor James and I were talking about this the other day. I am not sure I've ever heard a message on this passage, which means I have nothing to compare against, which may be a good thing, but it is one of the great Old Testament stories in the Bible. And we're going to look today at one of the characters in the Bible that really can be a lightning rod to a lot of people, which is King David. When you ask people, what are your thoughts about King David? You could get a whole realm of answers. Some would say he was the one who slew Goliath. He was the psalmist, the warrior. He was the one who wanted to build the house of God. He was the one from the lineage from which Jesus came. Then there's the dark side of his horrendous sin with Bathsheba, killing of Uriah, her husband. But we're going to look at a story involving David today, which I have entitled Living God's favor to others. You know, we all desire God's favor to be upon our lives. We do. We, we want God's favor to shine upon us. But as we look at this passage of scripture today, we're going to see an example of where one of God's men shared God's favor with others. So let's begin looking 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you would, please stand if you are able to honor the reading of God's holy word. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David and the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, we pray you'll speak to our hearts in this next few minutes. Father, show us what you would have us to, to know and to learn from this passage. Prepare our hearts, Father. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. When we look at this passage and we look at this story, there are four key characters. Two specifically, but the first off is obviously King David. Secondly was King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel. He was the king before David. Now King Saul started well and ended miserably. In fact, he turned his back on God so much that Samuel the prophet told Saul that God is ripping the kingdom out of your hands and giving it to someone better than you. The third person in the story is Jonathan. Jonathan was David's best friend ever. I will say this now, every one of us needs a Jonathan in our lives. To give you an idea, of the friendship Jonathan had for David. After David killed Goliath, the first time David and Jonathan met, Jonathan 
so the king's son, the prince, the next in line to be king, gives, John, gives David his sword, gives him his armor. And in 1 Samuel 18, it says their hearts were knitted together. Jonathan loved David so much that in 1 Samuel 23, while Saul is trying to hunt down and kill David, Jonathan hooks up with David and tells him, my dad knows you're going to be the next king and I am going to be standing beside you. I'm going to serve beside you. What a heart. Oh, do we all ever need Jonathans in our lives? The fourth person and the other key person in the story is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was five years old when his dad and his grandfather died in battle with the Philistines. When the word came to their home of the slaughter of the Israelites and the death of Saul and Jonathan, a nurse picked up Mephibosheth to take him and try to run to a place of safety and dropped him, and he became crippled. Mephibosheth, this is about 20 years later when we pick up the story. We also need to understand something else about the culture then. In fact, we even see it now today in some parts of the world, if there was a change in the monarchy from one family to the next, what normally happened to those from the former monarchy? They're put to death. So you got Mephibosheth, who has spent 20 years basically living in hiding, crippled. We know from passage he's still owned a little bit of property because Ziba actually helped watch over some of the property. But Mephibosheth had went from being third in line to be king to being a cripple fugitive. This is where we pick up the story at. And the first thing I want us to look at when we look at the life of Mephibosheth is Mephibosheth was a broken failure. You go, that's a little harsh. But the reality is at some point in our lives, every one of us could be considered a broken failure. You look at Mephibosheth. He, before he was five, you're talking about someone who was living in luxury, had the whole world ahead of him, And then one fateful day, things changed. Things changed. Back in that day and age, if you were someone who was crippled, most of the time, what you did for a living was beg. You see it throughout scriptures of people who had health disabilities. You think about the one in the book of John that Pastor James preached about a couple weeks ago who was wanting to be in the pool of Siloam so he could get healed because he was crippled. Mephibosheth was someone who did not have much hope. And like many, Mephibosheth was haunted by his past. He was haunted by his past. Again, you're talking about someone who had his whole life in front of him and it was taken away. I'm sure he must have thought, what would have happened if? The sad reality of today, though, is that too many people in the church today, believers, we're haunted by a sin from our past that is an anchor that the enemy is using to hold you down from being all that God wants you to be. Mephibosheth's anchor was again, he was terrified of the thought of David finding out that he was alive. Now, I'm sure when he was a little boy, he heard stories about David and his dad, Jonathan. But how much do we remember from when we were five? We have bits and pieces, but did he really remember the stories? He was haunted. He had everything, but his grandfather screwed up. 
and his grandfather screwing up led down to him becoming who he had become. You know, one of the challenges that we face as Christians a lot of times is if we have that thing that haunts us, we have been forgiven by God, but the truth of the matter is if we're still haunted by it, it means we haven't necessarily forgiven ourselves. And Satan, our enemy, is so fast to help us to remember the failure, but he doesn't remind us of our forgiveness. A lot of y'all may be haunted from your past today. But Mephibosheth wasn't only haunted, he was hurting from his past. You're talking about a what if story. How much of what Mephibosheth was going through was his fault? Was it his fault that his grandfather rejected God? Was it his fault that he was dropped and was crippled? Was it his fault that he was in a family that became outcast? No, not at all. He was hurting from events that had happened in his life. Struggling. The pain and suffering for him had to be overwhelming. But how many of us, <coughs> excuse me, are Mephibosheths in our own right? We've had people hurt us. We've had people let us down. And we haven't been able to let it go. We haven't been able to let it go. Some of it may be something we did and we can't face the other person. These are anchors that are holding us back. You know, it's, it, anchors are fascinating on boats. You have aircraft carriers that are dry docked. And as long as the anchors are holding them, they're not going anywhere. They're not. But you pull those anchors up. Ship can cruise away. <coughs> Excuse me. Mephibosheth was hurting from his past. He was haunted from his past, as some of you may be. But the beautiful part of the story and the beautiful part of knowing Jesus Christ, Mephibosheth was about to receive something he didn't deserve. It's called unmerited favor. The grace of God. How many of y'all are thankful for unmerited favor in your life today? Dwight L. Moody said that grace means undeserved kindness. It is the gift of God to man the moment that he sees that he is unworthy of God's favor. Jerry Bridges says your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace and your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Now for Mephibosheth, he was unable to help himself. He was unable to to help himself. He had to be cared for. You know, you look at the life of Mephibosheth, 
He couldn't run out and around and play with his other friends. After the age of five, he lost that ability. He couldn't even really go out at all because of fear of people going up to David and go, uh, you do realize that there are still people around. He was unable to help himself. And I wonder what went through his mind the day Zeba came to the house and said, the king wants to see you. I'm sure he was going like, me? Why? Why did you even tell the king that I was alive? Why? Where he lived was six and a half miles from Jerusalem. He had to be carried by cart there. What had to go through his mind? however long it took him to get to David. Was he thinking, okay, my life's over? What's the king going to do? He had no idea what was about to happen to him. So let's look at this chapter, at the rest of the story. Because we're going to see grace at work. We're going to see God's favor being used through David to help this poor, pitiful man. Verse seven. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant? That you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Mephibosheth was undeserving of David's help. You know, he had done absolutely nothing to deserve it. <coughs> Excuse me. He was Jonathan's son, yes. But how much did he do to become Jonathan's son? <laughs> Nothing. We, not, we None of us have control over our parents are. But David chose to show his love to Mephibosheth because he could. He could. You know, we have opportunities to reach out and love others. Don't miss out on the fact also that David sought out Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth wasn't seeking out David. He was hiding from David. 
David sought him out the same way God seeks us out to show us favor. Romans chapter five. The apostle Paul tells us in verses six through eight, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. We are no more deserving of the grace of God than Mephibosheth was of David's. But we have a great God. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who desires a relationship with us. He desires it so much that he was willing to sacrifice his son on the cross for our sins so we could have that relationship. Dr. Graham, when speaking on grace, said the motive of grace is the infinite, compassionate love of a merciful God, but the work of grace was the death of Christ on the cross. Mephibosheth comes to David, probably expecting to die and leaves a son. Don't miss this. Again, look at the verse here. Again, in verse 10, excuse me, in, yeah, verse 10, it says, but Mephibosheth, your master grandson, shall always eat at my table. David looked at him as his own son. He was gonna be eating at the table with the boys. What love. You go, I don't know if I'd have done that if I was David. Phibosheth still could have been a threat to the crown. David loved the Lord enough to trust God with that. And he picked up a young man who was crippled with no hope and gave him hope. Isn't that what God does with us? Read an interesting story, a little comment from Tony Evans was talking about grace. He says, the fact that you live a better life, do better things and are a nicer person may make you a better neighbor, but it doesn't make you fit for heaven. That can only happen by grace. Suppose three men decided that they wanted to swim to Hawaii one may swim further than the others, but the all three are going to end up the same way. Dead. Hawaii's too far. Our God is too high to get to reach him on our own. He's too holy for us, even on our best days, weeks, or years to make ourselves acceptable to him. Our salvation is based on God's grace. God's grace. David was showing God's grace to Mephibosheth. What did Mephibosheth have to offer David? Nothing. What do we have to offer God? But there is also another part of the story and the third part is the promise fulfilled. David had made a promise to Jonathan 20 plus years earlier that he would care for his family. And for David, a promise made was a promise done. How much more so with God, with us? But I want you to see also with David, as we look at David's part, David was available to help. He was available to help. He made himself available to help. 
Let's think for a moment on David. Try to put yourself in David's shoes for a moment. You are king over a nation. You're constantly at war. You're trying to get supplies together for on down the line for when your son is going to build a temple to God. You have all this stuff happening, all the busyness of life, and all suddenly out of the blue, he asks a question. Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show, show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Saul was the one trying to kill David. Saul was trying to kill David. He was hunting him down. A couple of times David had a chance to kill Saul himself and would not do it because he was more righteous. And now he's going, how can I show kindness to Saul's descendants? I am not so sure if I had someone who was trying to kill me that my thought would be, what can I do to help their family? So, some of y'all may be better than I and can do that. I'm not sure that would be my first thought. David had resources and was willing and available to fulfill his promise. He also, Ziba had told him that he is crippled in his feet and David didn't go, oh, if he's crippled, I don't think I can really help him. I'm gonna keep him to the side. He goes, bring them. Bring them. David was available to help, and the reason David was available to help was he had a heart for God. You know, we hear the story when Samuel goes to Jesse's sons, and the sons are all marching before Jesse, before Samuel. Oh, he looks like he's kingly. Nope, he's not the right one. Because David was a man after God's own heart. And this story demonstrates it. This story demonstrates why we see and hear David was a man after God's own heart. And don't miss out that David was willing to accept Mephibosheth for who he was. You know, why is that important? Because it's an example that God is willing to accept us no matter the ugliness we may have in our lives. You know, one of the tragedies of our church today is that we have people in the church of Jesus Christ who are spiritually crippled. They're spiritually crippled. You go, what do you mean by that? You won't let go of the anchor. You will not let go of these things that are keeping you from being all God wants you to be. God wants more for each of us. David brought Mephibosheth in and when he brought Mephibosheth in, guess what? He goes, oh, no, 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 you're, you're, you're my son now. You're my son. I'm treating you like my son. Go sit with Solomon. Go sit with Absalom. You are like a son to me. What about us? Ephesians chapter one, powerful passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the grace of his glorious, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. We are sons and we are daughters because of the grace of God. We've been invited to the table We've been invited to the table. But you know, Mephibosheth had a decision to make. You know, why do you mean Mephibosheth had a decision to make? What if Mephibosheth had looked at God and, I mean, God looked at David and goes, thanks, but no thanks. I'm gonna go back, load a beer, stay in hiding, be crippled, hungry, bitter. That sounds stupid, don't it? Why would anybody do that? Why? When the grace of God is available. So as Pastor James likes to say, so what? What does this mean to us? Right? You know, we may think the question to Mephibosheth was a crazy question, but really was it? Because how often does God offer his grace to us and we not accept it. How often? How often? When do we not accept what God is offering to us? Mephibosheth had the opportunity to accept the free gift that was given to him or turn it down. By the way, the end of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, some of the kids are going like, who's Paul Harvey? <laughs> Mephibosheth ate at David's table for the rest of his life. I was reading a book this week by Charles Swindoll. And I want to share these words from him. If you're feeling buried under your own sin, there's no way you can dig yourself out of the hole. Don't even try. On your own, you're done for. But along comes our gracious, loving God who sent his son to secure forgiveness and peace about our shortcomings and our failures. When Jesus went to the cross, died and paid your penalty, he took care of it all, past, your present, and your future. What about you though? There are some people here today that are suffering because you have chosen to hang on to your anchors. You've chosen to hang on to your anchors. What the anchors look like, you don't even know. Drop the anchors today. Come to know all God wants you to be. He wants more for you. He paid the ultimate price by having a son die on the cross for us, not just so that we can be saved, not just for him to be our Lord, but that he can pour his grace and mercy and blessings and favor upon us every day. But also, we can share God's favor with others. But what is it gonna be? 
I want to encourage you today. If you have anchors that are making you a spiritual cripple or you just know they're anchors that are holding you back from being what you can be, come to the altar, leave the anchors here and go back a new person. That's what God desires for each of us. Mephibosheth had decisions to make. His anchors were real. He was a crippled man. He was a fugitive who had no hope. You go, that's a horribly sad story. Each of us, before we knew Jesus Christ, had no hope until we came and and gave our lives to Christ. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, now is the day of salvation. Come to the table the way Mephibosheth did. Today is the day. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word, the honesty of your word. The stories are real. The lessons are real, but more importantly, your grace is real. Father, those today who are hearing this message, who are struggling, help them to let it go. Help them to let it go. Turn their struggles over to you to know you fresh and new today. And we just pray you'll do a great work in Christ's holy name, amen.